As human beings, the loss of a close family member is perhaps the most trying and difficult thing we can go through in our lives. Tonight's story, another from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you, deals with such issues. So, even though there's a strong element of the supernatural and the unknown, if you've suffered from loss recently, or you feel that this is something that's going to upset you, then just a quick heads up, this story might not be for you. Now, there's nearly 400 in the uh, back catalogue, so please go and listen to something else if you think you might be affected by this one. But this one is extremely weird and intriguing, so for those of you who want to go ahead, then sit back and relax with your favourite drink, because it's time once again to listen. Do you know how easy it is to break a man and send him spiralling down the never-ending path of self-destruction at the bottom of the bottle? Well, it takes about a single action in the time span of a single moment. This is how I found myself where I am today. Four years ago, my daughter, Adriana, started mentioning someone called Ellen around the age of four. It all began after a birthday party of her cousin, Michael. As we were about to head home, she grabbed me by my pants and asked my wife, Miranda, and me if she could bring a certain Ellen along with her. That name. It had brought some painful memories, but I'd decided to keep quiet about it and acted as if it had meant nothing to me. We asked her, curiously, Who's Ellen, darling? My daughter started looking around as if she was looking for someone, and then said, She's my new friend. She probably went to get her coat now. We immediately figured out it was an imaginary person, and the idea of our sweet little girl having her first imaginary friend thrilled Miranda and I. Huh, it's another stage in the child's mental growth, after all. So, understandably, we decided to let Adriana bring her new friend home with her, in spite of the weird naming coincidence, I thought nothing of it in the beginning. For me and my wife, well, it was just an imaginary friend. Soon enough, Adriana became so preoccupied with the imaginary friend, she'd stop playing with her kindergarten mates. It didn't worry us, though. We thought it was just another phase in her growth. Believing she wanted to be on her own for some time, believing this imaginary friend to be her way to express her inner world. Our lack of concern stemmed from the fact she hadn't done anything uncommon for children her age and didn't become distant from us or other people well, emotionally. The one odd thing was that whenever I or Miranda was in proximity of my sweet child, she would claim that her imaginary friend had vanished saying her new friend would later give her different explanations for her disappearances in my or Miranda's presence. One time, I'd asked her if she knew why this happened, and she had no idea, citing that her friend might just be shy. I decided to ask her to describe her friend to me, and she said Ellen looked like a normal adult girl. Well, according to Adriana, she had blue hair like the weird kids in our neighbourhood, well, referring to the goth scene teens around here. My dear child further explained that Ellen preferred to wear long skirts and had a monster's mouth. To my surprise, my girl gave me the description of a realistic normal human being, well, for the most part. About a year after we first heard about Ellen, Adriana began acting differently from the way she'd used to. She insisted that the window in her bedroom would always remain open, and she had trouble getting up to go to kindergarten. Even more so, she began acting strangely independent for a five-year-old. Adriana even told me once that something in Ellen reminded her of me. I've concluded that she just took inspiration from my personality when she was making Ellen up, and didn't want to think of that remark too much. At that point, we'd started allowing our little angel to go off on her own to play in the park next to our house. It was basically around the corner. And so, one time, after going out and not showing up home for many hours, naturally Miranda went out to see what Adriana was up to. But she wasn't there. 
my sweet little daughter, was gone. Panic set in. We began questioning people and calling in each and every person that might know Adriana as we were looking for her, but nobody had seen her that day. God, it was terrible. Losing my sweet little girl was the worst thing that could have happened to me. I began losing it. And then, at around 8.30pm, a knock on our door rang through my ears. Miranda ran to the door, and once she opened it, she saw our sweet little Adriana standing there, with a lollipop in her mouth. I immediately ran up to hug her. I couldn't even be mad at her for disappearing on us like that. After a few moments, Adriana said, I was out with Ellen. She even bought me this candy. I was filled with horror. How could an imaginary friend buy my sweet little girl a candy? Morbid ideas began filling my mind. What if there was some child offender around her? I began thinking that my little girl might be suffering from some hallucinatory condition and decided to check up on this by making her stop meeting with this Ellen person. Well, thing. It had to go. From the name to our daughter's strange behavior, it all had to go. This thing simply had to go away and be forgotten. Obviously, our sweet little child was heartbroken by my request. But what could I do otherwise? I had to know what was going on, and I had no other way to do so. Adriana didn't really have a choice, and she did as she was told. The next morning, Adriana told us she'd spoken with Ellen the night prior, and that Ellen had promised to stay away from her. She also said Ellen left her a bag of gummy worms as a parting gift. The sickening thought of a child offender around my daughter filled my mind once more, how could a little girl possibly get out of this house in the middle of the night? And where would she get those candies? Just to be sure, I asked around if anyone had seen Adriana acting oddly, or if anyone had seen her with some stranger. Much to my surprise, nobody had. Every time someone told me they'd seen Adriana, she was either behaving normally alone or with the other kids. Luckily, shortly after... We stopped hearing about Ellen, and Adriana returned to being the way she was a year before. A month, exactly one month after Adriana told this Ellen thing to go, my wife disappeared, just like that, as if the earth itself swallowed her whole. On a Thursday in October, my wife didn't come back home at the usual hour. But first, I thought she was doing overtime at work. But after three hours had passed without any sign from Miranda, I decided to call her. Nothing came of it. Absolutely nothing. I couldn't reach her. I started calling her colleagues, and they told me the same thing. Every single one of them. Miranda had left for home, as she usually does. No one knew where she'd been. Panic set in. I was flipping out. Once Adriana had seen me throw in a fit, she quickly realized something wasn't right with me. She asked me what was wrong. I told her the truth, that her mother was nowhere to be found. My sweet little child broke down into tears and didn't stop crying until she passed out from exhaustion. I followed in her step shortly after. I realized I couldn't stop the rain coming out of her eyes. A grown man, crying himself to sleep. I'm not even ashamed to admit it. Then, the hours turned into a whole day. I went to the police station to report that my wife had gone missing, and the search for her began. A week after my wife had disappeared, I broke down into tears again. Adriana, my sweet little angel, caught me weeping and hugged me tightly, saying... Daddy, don't cry. Mommy's gonna come back, I know for sure. Her sweet smile made me stop crying. I wiped the tears off my face and told her, oh, Sweetie, Daddy's crying because something like this happened to him once before. 
Adriana gave me a puzzled look and asked, You lost Mom once? I chuckled and said, No. You see, when I was younger, before I met Mommy, I was in love with this girl named Anna, and she was in love with me. So we had a baby girl, and then we decided to get married. Oh, we went to pick a beautiful wedding dress for Anna, so she could look like a princess when we got married. But on our way back home, my car got involved in a terrible accident. Both of my girls, they died. I began sobbing softly again, and Adriana's embrace tightened around me. She stared me dead in the eyes and said, in a very adult manner, Daddy, stop it. Now you have Mommy and me. I'm sure she'll be back, okay? I promise you. I could feel her voice shaking and her tears falling down on my shoulder. My little girl's response made me feel proud. To me, it was obvious she understood the meaning of loss, regardless of her young age. She understood things that people usually learn to understand far later in life. A sweet little five-year-old understood the meaning of death. It was both a moment of pride and pain. I mean, she was so young, and yet I knew it wasn't my right to fill my angel's mind with such dark and complicated things, and so I forced myself to behave as normal as possible for the rest of the evening around her. I decided I wouldn't make her go to kindergarten the day after our very mature conversation. She'd had a rough week and deserved to get some rest as much as I did, so I let her sleep as much as she wanted. She'd slept through the whole morning of that Friday, and at first I didn't worry about it. She did have a tough time, but once it got to midday and Adriana hadn't got up, I started getting worried about her, thinking she might be ill or too depressed to come down. So I went up to her room and opened the door gently. I wasn't expecting to find what I did in my little sweet daughter's room. I swear, the image is in front of me in my little angel's bedroom some of the most terror-inducing things I've ever experienced in my life. As I shoved the door open slowly, I saw her legs. Her small, pale legs. They were a meter above the floor, swinging softly with the rest of her body. Swinging softly, was my sweet little girl's body. A noose was tied around her gentle neck, while the other side of the rope was suspending her lifeless angelic shell above the ground, tied to the lamp on the ceiling. Her head tilted slightly to the side, her dark blonde hair covering her face. However, her eyes, oh, her dead, lifeless, ice-cold eyes, I could see their stare. My sweet little girl's eyes. They weren't angelic anymore. Oh, the small green orbs in my angel sockets. They were judging. Mocking. As if death itself was staring at me whilst telling me some dark joke. The sight of my sweet little daughter's broken body hanging there made me break down. I fell down to my knees and began screaming and hitting the floor with my fists. This could not be happening to me again. It just could not be. It simply could not be true. I tried to convince myself that it was just a nightmare, simply a dream. I tried making myself believe I was going to wake up next to my wife in a few minutes, but that did not happen. It all felt too real. The tears, the sensation of pain in my fists, the cold sensation. The floor gave away. The stench, it was all too bloody real. My life had turned into my worst nightmare. Again. I called the cops to report I'd found my daughter hanging in her room. They arrived shortly after and took her body. 
Since there were no signs of intrusion or struggle, and my five-year-old sweet angel could not possibly know how to commit suicide, it had originally been concluded that I was the prime suspect in my own sweet daughter's death. I could never do such a thing, not in a million years, not under any circumstances. I loved her too much. There was one neighbor of mine who told the cops that he'd seen a small figure enter my property at night and leave shortly after. However, because he admitted to being intoxicated that night, this wasn't taken into account. The reasoning of the cops behind their accusation was that I'd probably experienced some acute mental breakdown in the aftermath of my wife going missing and ended up murdering my daughter while I was not in my right mind. Luckily, all the charges against me were dropped shortly after when zero shreds of evidence against me were amassed following a bunch of tests and a lie detector session. If only they'd believed me from the start. I loved, I, I still love Adriana too much to cause her any harm. After once again losing the two girls I cared about, I began drinking, heavily. I couldn't keep a steady job and found I was suffering from alcoholism. I was stuck in the gutter, so much so that I simply couldn't lead a normal life. I wanted to take my own life, but never managed to will myself to end it in one fell swoop. <laughs> I planned to drink myself to death. On a cold February night, at 3 a.m., I received a call. On the other side of the line, there was a policeman who said my wife had been found. Her body, that is. Five months after she disappeared, they had finally found her. I've been told to arrive at the local police station, so I dragged myself out of bed, got myself dressed, and drowsily drove to the police station. Once I arrived at the station, they had me see the corpse of my wife. I'd spare most of the details, as she was in a progressive state of decay. One thing about her body that made me puke my guts right up onto the floor beneath me was, well, her scalp and brain were missing and I was told that there were scrape marks on the inside of her cranial cavity, resembling the marks of a very sturdy spoon. I was notified that my wife's corpse was found in the backyard of some elderly couple, a few blocks from where I live. Her body was found beside some woman who was simply sitting there, as if waiting to be noticed. I was asked to see if I could identify the woman, as she kept going on about how she knew me. They walked me through a hallway to a room with a thick glass wall. On the other side of that sat someone I never expected to see. The woman on the other side of the glass wall was a mirror image of Adriana's imaginary friend. A middle height woman wearing a long white skirt. Her long hair had been dyed in blue and she had a monstrous jaw mask hanging around her neck. I was petrified at the sight of her. She... She couldn't be a real person. She was supposed to be imaginary. If she were, she wouldn't get lost when my daughter told her to. It doesn't work like that, does it? My insides were turning, but I had to keep my cool next to this cop. And so I did. He told me her name was Elena Shamunia and asked me if I had any idea who she was. I replied in the negative. Even though I had no clue who she was, she seemed so familiar. And what's more, something about her deep blue eyes and devious smile was way too familiar. Even that name, it drove me nuts. Painful memories. The name Elena is the name I'd given to my first daughter. That's why the name Ellen felt so uncomfortable to me when Adriana first mentioned it. I should have seen the signs. They were all over the wall. Something was really not right with this woman, and it made me feel visibly awkward. She must have noticed my discomfort, 
and once the cop and I had turned our backs to her, she stood up and came to the glass wall. Once she reached the glass, she said something that still resonates in my mind to this day, so long after our encounter. Her words completely shattered me inside. My surroundings, my, well, my everything. I never thought a sweet voice like hers could break someone like it did to me. She said, Don't lie to them, Daddy. Of course you know me. After all, you're the one who named me Alina Antonia Nyholm. She wasn't lying. I did name my first daughter just that. I stormed out of the room, shaking uncontrollably. This didn't make any sense. How could she know? She couldn't have known any of this. I mean, I haven't told anyone about either her or Anna since I moved here. Well, indeed, of course, people knew I had a girlfriend I was about to marry, and a child, both of whom had died, but nobody should have known their names. I never mustered out the guts to go back into that room. I just left the building, telling the cops I couldn't handle seeing her. Well, I really couldn't stand the sight of her face. But none of this made any sense. It still doesn't. I never bothered checking on what became of this Selena person. I'd lie if I said I didn't care. I just couldn't handle facing this monstrosity again. Her voice still haunts me in my nightmares, that eerily familiar voice. She sounded so much like my Anna. I never was able to quit drinking. I did get some help though, and I'm now drinking in moderation, but I still don't think I'll ever be able to get over this whole thing. I just lost too much to be able to handle it on my own. One question that will probably never be solved is... If that sick, murderous woman is my daughter, how on earth did she survive this car crash? I saw her. I clearly remember. I can't get this image out of my head. She was so clearly not breathing. While that one definitely intrigued me, I still don't quite know what to make of it. Um, very, very strange. Lots of uh, loose ends, and generally um, a bit <laughs> confusing. But something about it really appealed to me, so I felt like I had to read it all to you. I hope it wasn't too upsetting for those of you who persevered. Once again, you know, if I think it is something that might be upsetting, I will always warn you in the introduction. Well, my dear friends, we've made it to Friday. I will be returning to Breach, the, opera the military operation stories, on Monday. A couple more have been written by Amelie Longlois, and looking forward to reading those for you. So, you all have a safe weekend. Those of you who are working, don't work too hard. If you get a chance, listen to these stories, and I hope that it helps time pass. But, for now, that's all for me. So, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?